Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the AAA and National Archaeology Week series of, summit, of webinars that we're running, which is shining a spotlight on a different area of Australian archaeology each day. Australian archaeology is wonderfully diverse, and we're pleased to be able to share with you this week some of the different areas. Today, our focus is First Peoples Archaeology, and later in the week, we'll also be visiting maritime archaeology, aviation archaeology, conflict archaeology, and on the last day on Friday, a snapshot of the industry. I'm Dr. Caroline Spry. I'm Joint National Coordinator for National Archaeology Week, and I'll be the primary host today. I'm also joined by my co-hosts, Vanella Atkinson, who's our Joint National Coordinator and who's been doing a wonderful job of that for a very long time, and Paul Gale as well, who is on the Outreach and Engagement Committee for the Australian Archaeological Association. I'd just like to acknowledge that today I'm talking to you from the lands of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to say thank you to the Australian Archaeological Association for hosting this event. There's just a few housekeeping things before I get into introductions. So first of all, this is a recorded presentation. All of the presentations this week will be recorded apart from Fridays. Uh, if you're an attendee today and you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. Don't use the chat function. And a reminder to my co-hosts and presenter, please remember to turn off your video and audio when you're not presenting or talking. So I'd like to introduce to you Dave Johnston, who is one of Australia's first university qualified Indigenous archaeologists. He's a member of the Stolen Generations, but this year was reunited with his biological family. He has both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage as and is named after his father, David Keko Pitt, with applicable ancestry to Moa Island, the Kwandamuka, Inangai, and connections to the Bachula and the Gugu Yulanji. Dave has worked on over 2,500 heritage projects a very big number, and was the 2014 recipient of the Sharon Sullivan National Heritage Award for his contribution to the Australian Indigenous heritage environment and his continuing influence on practice. He is the founding chair of the Australian Indigenous Archaeologists Association. So I'd just like to invite Dave now to turn on his audio and turn on his video. And I'm going to start to share his presentation. So I'll just bring that up. So David's presentation is entitled Australian Aboriginal Heritage Site Protection. Is this a crisis or the status quo? Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much, Caroline. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. And I particularly um, I'm pleased to be able to present a paper um, tonight for National Archaeology Week. I'm a proud archaeologist, have been for 30 something years. Um, as my title says, folks, I've been delivering this talk for decades now, as I've part of my career, I've watched the legislation of Australia's and, and management of Australia's Indigenous heritage decline. There are a lot of positives in our discipline of the works we do, but my career, I have found, has been defined having my, you know, the Hazel and days with the Australian Heritage Commission. My first job back in 1990 with Sharon Sullivan, Betty, me, and Joe Flood at the Heritage Commission, Dr. Liz Williams, Marilyn Truscott. I watched them as our legislation through the the EPBC Act and the Howard era. Uh, what I saw is the mining boom, dumb down our heritage legislations our state uh, legislations, our Commonwealth responsibilities to the nation and managing its heritage. And it's just been a gradual decline, which has been really depressing, certainly seeing in states where now we, we thought we were having issues in certain states like WA, even Queensland, but it's just happening at a rapid rate of destruction, wanton, that um, it is really quite depressing. It's depressing. And a reflection, I think, poorly on our nation, and unfortunately also on our archaeological discipline. So the, the title, my title is Australian Aboriginal Heritage Site Protection. Is this this crisis or the status quo? I'll let you make your own mind up. I've certainly got mine. 
Um, next slide, please, uh, if I make, um, Caroline. Thank you. So, folks, I apologise. Some of the, the first little section I have been talking about for a couple of decades now, raising what we had and what are what I saw were minimum national standards that we needed to, to needed to have or we did have. Everything in terms of a future and a state of environment of where we're going or what, what of our current state of environment um, is manageable. Certainly for some of the um, acts or processes um, we had in, in, in place in previous years that were enacted within our legislations or in a professional cultural heritage management process. So, and I'll go through these, and I have shown these, spoken about these many times before. You know, the frameworks for heritage protection are still directly relevant. The UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration. I'm going to go through through these. The Borough Charter, Ask First, World Archaeological um, uh, Archaeological Code of Ethics, the Australian Association's Code of Ethics, which is relevant to us as archaeologists, and the Australian Heritage Legislation. But first, we need to understand Indigenous values to country and sites. If I have, may have the next slide, please, Mara. So thank you. So folks, as we go through, you know, firstly, why is heritage important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? We know that it is. And it's been articulated well within the, well, back in the Heritage Commission days under the Ask for First Guidelines, which are still utilised by the Commonwealth Government. Maintaining heritage values, and I'll read those because they're, they're integral to what we're discussing. Maintaining heritage values and places is a vital part of the community's sense of place, cultural identity and well-being. This is particularly true for Indigenous Australians whose heritage creates and maintains links between ancestors, people and the land. Indigenous heritage is dynamic. It includes, as we know, tangible and intangible expressions of culture that link generations of Indigenous people over time. Indigenous people express our cultural heritage through the person, our relationship with country, people, beliefs, knowledge, land, language, symbols, ways of living, sea, land, so as language, and objects, all of which arise from Indigenous spirituality. Indigenous heritage places are landscapes, sites, and areas that are particularly important to Indigenous people as part of our customary law, developing traditions, history, and current practices. All Indigenous heritage places have associated Indigenous heritage values. Next slide, please, Chris. Caroline. One of the things which is important, this is the, I've long lobbied, as I argue, we've got to have a, a moral basis. Australia's, you know, took years to, but we did sign up to the United, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's one thing to sign up and be part of, but actually enacting it. And this is, I think, where we fa have failed over the years and continually to do, em embarrassingly so. I'll go through the key points that are relevant to us and our rights to maintain adequate heritage within our country. Article 8, Indigenous peoples. And if I could get that slide up again. Was, um, Article 8, Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to force assimilation or structure of their culture. States shall provide effective mechanisms for, for prevention of and redress for any action which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples of their cultural values or ethnic identities. Article 11, we've signed up to these. Indigenous peoples have the right to practice and revitalize their culture and traditions and customs. This includes the right to maintain, protect and develop the past, present and future manifestations of their cultures, such as archaeological and historical sites, artefacts, designs, ceremonies, technologies, visual and performing arts and literature. States shall provide redress through effective mechanisms, which may include restitution developed in conjunction with Indigenous peoples with respect to their cultural, intellectual, religious and spiritual property, taking without their free prior and informed consent or in violation of their laws, traditions and customs. Next slide, please. Article 26, Indigenous peoples have the right to the lands, territories and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied or otherwise used or acquired. Indigenous peoples have the right to own, use, develop and control the lands, territories and resources that they possess by reason of traditional ownership 
or other traditional occupational use, as well as those which they have otherwise acquired. Three, states shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories and resources. Such recognition can be conducted with due respect to the customs, tradition and land tenure systems of the Indigenous peoples concerned. I contend that Australian government now, uh, public service in terms of going to these meetings, discussing human rights, we're a big talker, but we actually don't practice what we preach. We can't be if we're blowing up sites that are ancient, have significance. We've never addressed, and recently, adequate management protection in this country. I think we should be pulled up before the UN um, as an abject failure in relation to heritage management in this country. And I shouldn't be, as my people's, the only ones speaking out for this. It is an indictment on our nation and how we treat our Indigenous peoples, our heritage, um, and I would argue our Australian heritage. Next slide, please. Folks, I've been around for now, this is my fourth decade in this industry, in this discipline. Um, what I saw when I came through was the best practice um, in place for international, minimum international standards for maintaining cultural and heritage management and, and been particularly recording the values and in, in relation to Indigenous peoples, our social values, connections to country. And of course, this and if I would argue, we need to go back to some of these, maybe reinvent, re, uh, revamp, have it in more in a modern context. But these are the bases of which I saw in my career as being the minimum standards to man maintaining and identifying cultural heritage values. And this, of course, was through the Barra Charter, which is in South Australia, um, um, and, and through ICOMOS. And ICOMOS being the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Uh, we still have a large ECOMOS um, committee uh, in Australia and they have long been promoting for greater Indigenous uh, heritage recognition and recording. Traditionally a very historic built environment, but have long been supporters of Indigenous rights and heritage management. It's a non-government professional organisation formed in 1965, closely linked to UNESCO, particularly the World Heritage Convention 1972. In the Borough Charter, cultural significance means aesthetic, historic, scientific or social value, and that's the key one, for past, present or future generations. Article two, conservation and management. Places of cultural significance should be conserved. The aim of conservation is to retain the cultural significance of a place. Conservation is, integral, is an integral part of good management of places of cultural significance. Where is the good management being in Indigenous heritage? And why is it not? Is it greed? Is it racism? Uh, you know, we need to start addressing these issues because it's been going on too long. Finally, places of cultural significance should be safeguarded and not put at risk or left in a vulnerable state. I may have my next slide. I'd like to discuss and show this, this table, the Borough Charter process. Folks, this is some of your minimum standards and I'd like to go through them because we seem to be now seeking information, destroying them, mitigate as the mining industry uses the language and others, and we are destroying it before we're doing regional local assessments. In these times of mining boom, we've got governments and state legislations that are just allowing it wantonly being destroyed. The first point is identify a place, and I'm just going to go through the key basic and best practices of recording, identifying and managing heritage values. Identify place and association, secure the place and make it safe. Gather and record information about the place. Sufficient. And let's just do this in a context of um, Yukon Gorge, Yukon Gorge, or for God's sake, the Barrack Peninsula, or many the, the tens of thousands of sites that are being destroyed daily. Gather and record information about the place, sufficient to understanding significance, documentary, oral, physical. We need to go back to these bases of proper uh, cultural heritage management and recording. They assess the significance, not on how much coal or ore is not going to be mined, but on its heritage value. Prepare a statement of significance. Identify obligations arising from the significance. We could have done with this in Juk and Gorge. Gather information about other factors affecting the future of the place. Owner, managers, needs and resources, external factors and the physical condition. Develop policy, identify options, consider options and test the, the, the impact on significance. And then prepare a statement of policy. 
and then finally onto management. Manage place in accordance with that policy. Develop strategies, implement strategies through a management plan. Uh, record place prior to any change. And then monitor and review. How do, as I've long said, do we get as a nation and have a Commonwealth agency that over the years has rolled out its responsibility over the states and continued that has allowed a state to bring down its legislation to legally destroy its, its, some of its most significant indigenous heritage. The Commonwealth is responsible, I'd argue, as are our states. And we need to go back, roll back the process. And I would call for a Royal Commission into how this has occurred. I would argue that it's greed um, and I would argue that there is racial angles in there, um, in the, in the uh, opportunism to destroy Indigenous heritage, treat our people like this and destroy our most significant sites. And again, these are all Australia's sites. If I can get the next slide, please. We have the, what was also in place and it's still a Commonwealth policy. Um, a number of us were involved in writing, preparing this and doing the Indigenous consultations. We did. Linda Borch and I did 300 consultations with 350 communities around Australia to prepare this Ask First with Chrissy Grant and the Australian Heritage Team at the time. Still in place, needs to be updated. But Ask First, a guide to respecting Indigenous heritage places and values developed by the Heritage Commission in 2002. That's how long ago. It provides a practical guide for land developers, land users and managers, cultural heritage professionals and many others who have an impact on Indigenous heritage process of consultation and negotiation, identifying Indigenous heritage places and values, manage Indigenous heritage places, pro promotes a form of agreement that aligns with the principles of pre, prior and informed consent. It alarms me, these native title agreements that are so secret between mining companies, communities that we don't even know or see, and what are in those agreements? And do those agreements align with um, pre, prior and informed consent? And do they align with best cultural heritage management practice? I just still don't know how we can get places like Jukun Gorge destroyed or the Burrup Peninsula, which I've long argued should have been a World Heritage listed area the size of a national park. Instead, disgracefully, it's graded piles of ancient etchings within fenced within areas and everyone still knowing getting the blame for having done that. And we're sitting there with looking like fools. If I can get the next slide, please. We also had those involved with us in the World Archaeological Congress. And this was back in the day, this is back in 1990 when we were, Hirani and Matunga and I wrote, drafted up this, the WAC, um, and, and with our councils coming on board to this. It was about Indigenous rights, but recognising, we're going to the phase of archaeologists over science over the rights of communities. It's, it's, it's archaic stuff, but we had to deal with it then. Where have we gone today? The World Archaeological Congress is a non-government governmental for not-for-profit organisation is the only represented worldwide body of practising archaeologists. I won't go through. Members agree that they have obligations to Indigenous peoples and that they shall abide by the following principles. To acknowledge the importance of Indigenous cultural heritage, including sites, places, objects, artefacts, human remains, to the survival of Indigenous cultures. Members agree they will adhere to the following rules prior to and during after their investigations. Members shall negotiate with an, and obtain the for, informed consent of representatives authorised by the Indigenous peoples whose cultural heritage is the subject of investigation. To all Indigenous Australians, I'd say we have let the guard down if we're allowing our, our native title lawyers and anthropologists to speak for us or make agreements for us. Um, we need to take back, as Melissa George, our former chair of the Indigenous Advisory Committee, said for many years, we need to own and put our hands on the wheels of the bus that we are driving. I would argue that this hasn't, um, uh, hasn't occurred. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. We also have, which we've been members for ages, the Australian Archaeological Association Codes of Ethics, of which we've now had two, three um, drafts. And we were involved years ago in setting it up, Robin Bancroft and myself, uh, proposed that in ninth after we had the WAC conference and others and um, the association at the time member had proud we were in 91 when the association adopted it without I might say there was a lot of do it and um, um, 
distrust in it having this. But members recognise these are some basic principles, folks. Members recognise that there are many interests in the cultural heritage, but they specifically acknowledge the rights and interests of Indigenous peoples. We've got some more later and more up-to-date versions, but it's, it's the AA endorses direct members to the current guidelines for ethical research and Indigenous parties are stat published by their access um, by IAPSIS. Members will negotiate equitable agreements between archaeologists and Indigenous communities whose cultural heritage can be investigated. Archaeologists have, tr communities have trust in archaeologists, and if that's being betrayed, then through the proponents, and there's a breakdown, we've got to relook at that, and I'll argue that a little bit later. AAC endorses direct members to the current guidelines. Next slide, please. I keep trying this. Yes. Folks, the, one of the biggest tragedies we've ever had was the, in relation to the Australian heritage legislation is the Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act, 94. This was set up so that Indigenous peoples or communities at the last moment where states or threats were sites were occurring, we could call on the Commonwealth government to intervene, to put an emergency declaration. I don't have the exact numbers, but we, you know, in the prior to the 2011 state of environment, there were 350 applications. Now there's been over 800 by communities. It's only been a handful, I believe, of those applications that were ever enacted. They've all been rejected for years during that mining boom. The government sat on that. I think this is criminal. And I, another reason I think for a, a, a Royal Commission, we should ask, because I would say the Commonwealth government is complicit in this wanton destruction of our heritage and sites. And one of the things where they did was sit on this act for years and years. They're starting to look at it now. There's been reviews. I would like to have this as the Royal Commission because the, the word is, and I believe that the Commonwealth lawyers who were responsible for this act were the ones who went to WA and rewrote their heritage legislation. Let's get the truth of this because if this is the truth, we have Commonwealth agencies being directly related, uh, related, related to the destruction and wanton destruction of our, our history and heritage, how we got to Jukun Gorge. The Australian, we have the Australian Heritage Council, um, which is looking after a top 10 list. Where was the Australian Heritage Council in Jukun? Where, who's, under whose watch is this, are, are people responsible? No one's getting blamed. And um, we need to objectively, and Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people demand an, an inquiry into this. Not just and not just represented by those who may have an impact or have been complicit in that destruction. And I would argue that the Commonwealth government has been. It's under their watch. You know how relevant is the Australian Heritage Council if this is where we're at? Um, the sorry, the amendments to the, there is a review still on the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Heritage Act. We need to get that app happening so our people have the right to have the last resort to protect and look after our sites when, our, when we have maverick states with maverick legislation that are wantingly destroying our people. Next slide, please. So I'd argue now, there is, we have to have responsibility of the Australian government um, to oversee the, the states to ensure that there are minimum national standards, best world practice to ensure the management and protection of our sites and heritage in each state, particularly when we have maverick states and maverick heritage legislation. I was a member of the Indigenous Advisory Committee for many years and under five ministers, we kept saying, we have to go in and bat for the West, the, with our, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Western Australia, because they're being destroyed, their sites are being destroyed wantonly. The minister said, had many, many times agreed, but this has not happened. And I would argue under the WA Heritage Review that it's still not happening. The might and, uh, of the mining industry in WA over its people, over indigenous people's values, the protection of sites um, continues to this day. And there's nothing more than greed and racism from my opinion. It is the status quo in, over there particularly, and we cannot allow that to happen. So the Commonwealth has responsibilities to oversee the sites, I would argue. Under the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Heritage Act, we need to get that invoked again. I'd argue, and as a conclusion, that we need to set up an Australian Indigenous Heritage Commission that can oversee the management of, of a national heritage regime from a Commonwealth responsibility and overseeing the states. We've long called for this. It's nothing new. And it could fit in with an Australian Indigenous heritage. Um, 
one of the things of the responsibility of the of the Commonwealth, particularly, is the national state of the environment reporting process. We need, and there's one happening at the moment, and they uh, they're promoting that there are a number of indigenous um, uh, 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 authors. Now, this is wonderful and great. We've got indigenous authors, but are we? And I hope we are addressing the themes that we need to address. Are we under the Australian Heritage Environment and Heritage um, Regime? Are we addressing how we're blowing up forty-six thousand-year-old sites? As I've been, we've been saying, this process of dumbing down our heritage legislation has been happening a long time. It didn't just happen with the, the destruction of a of the of the Jukun. We've lost Mund from Monday Swamp, the Burrett Peninsula. Jukun and around, uh, there are many other sites in WA that have been destroyed, as within all the other states and territories. It's been a long process. There's been a golden brick road laid out for, for WA to allow this site destruction to occur. It's happened over a long time, and we as a nation have to take accountability for this. We need to go back to the basics of what heritage, but we have to address truth telling. We have to address how is this happening and what role this is why we ha we have to have a royal commission to address this wanton destruction it's 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 bordering on genocide when you're destroying people's sites and heritage and this change this outrage didn't happen here domestically in australia it was reported it was because of the result of the black lives matter where where um overseas media communities were looking at us and at that moment the Western Australian government, government is digging indigenous graves and, and robbing them in terms of destroying, destroying sites. So there was outrage through the mining and Rio Tinto and its stakeholders that made and led to the change there. But we also need to lead, have the change happening here and have our state and Commonwealth governments responsible for their actions. And we, therefore we need truth telling um, in this country. And if we have to use the racist card and the greed card, we have to, because it cannot keep going on at this rate. Um, it's an international disgrace to us, our nation, um, our values, um, and how we are treating our people and our heritage. Um, if I may, the next slide, please. Folks, I'm getting on an issue which is really quite concerning. Is state, is state heritage legislation consistent with the Native Title Act? What conflicts could arise I'm going to read now, for example, uh, in Victoria, I think we have a problem with, with native title in this country. And I say this to all Indigenous Australians. I think we need a Royal Commission into the handling of native title and perhaps the collusion between state and heritage governments and those handling and representing us. And I'm going to use the example from the recent Tungarong, Ghana versus Tungarong case in Victoria. This was, I am reading, quoting from the Bendigo Advertiser so that there is no misunderstanding of what the case was or, or my um, views on it. A group of Aboriginal elders or retirees and pensioners have won a David and Goliath battle in the federal court. The four elders case against the Tungarong Land and Waters Council, the state of Victoria and the native title register was about the process by which an indigenous land use agreement was registered. The boundary of the areas in question sites near Rochester, Gornong and Heathcote. Each claim to hold native title and part of the area claimed by the Tungarong Council under the agreement. Federal Court Judge Deborah Mortimer upheld an application for a judicial review of a decision made by a delegate of the native title registrar in April 2020 to register the Tungarong Settlement Indigenous Land Use Agreement. The case was brought by four objectors, Margaret Gardner, Gary Murray, Vincent Peters and Elizabeth Thorpe against the Tungong Land and Waters Council, the state of Victoria and the native title registrar. Justice Mordor concluded there were juridis, juridis, jurisdictional errors in the registration of the Tungong Land and Waters Council's indigenous land use agreement by the native title registrar. Justice Mortimer said these relatively these re reveal significant, significantly material and significant errors of law by the delegate and the re re registration decision cannot be said to be lawful to be a lawful discharge of her function. 
Justice Mortimer upheld two of the applicant's grounds for objection to the registration. One, that the native title registrar delete, delegate asked herself the wrong questions by accepting First Nations legal reliance on its database of more than 150 people when there was a live and central factual issue to determine. The objectors argued that the database overlooked some people who reasonably claimed to hold native title interests and over the part of the area subject to the ILUA, the Indigenous Land Usage Agreement. The second ground was that the delegate failed to engage with affidavit evidence from the objectors prior to registration, characterising it as, an, as assertions when it was in fact sworn evidence she was bound to take into account. Justin Mortimer said, Ray, raised a serious question about the composition process of applicable ancestor list in the ILUA, in the land usage agreement, which was critical because rights and interest in land were acquired by dissent. She said parts of the affidavit evidence presented quite a different account of the efforts made by legal representatives to identify all persons who hold or may hold native title over an area. Justice Mortimer said this could not be dismissed without consideration. The Native Title Act 1993 states a representative body must have all reasonable efforts to identify people who hold or may hold native title in an area covered by, a, by an Indigenous land use agreement before certifying the application. Or persons identified must also have authorised the making of agreements, the Act states. We have another case in Victoria where uh, with the Boomerang Land and Sea Corporation who are pursuing a native title claim, having horrendous dealings with the uh, Victorian Heritage Council and the First Nations. There is a real conflict that exists under the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Act and the native title rights and interests of native title claimants. In Victoria, the Aboriginal Heritage Council can appoint an organisation as a recognised Aboriginal party, RAP. The Aboriginal Heritage Council is a non-elected body appointed by the minister and they make decisions as to who they define as traditional owners. This is the key, folks. In Victoria in 2007, the Aboriginal Heritage Council made the remarkable decision to appoint an organisation as a RAP which represented Tasmanian and Western Australian people, all based on the claim that they believed they had an ancestor taken from their country approximately 200 years ago. The Aboriginal Heritage Council defines a traditional owner as someone who, for the purpose of this act, a person is a traditional owner of an area. If the person is an Aboriginal person with particular knowledge about traditions, observances, customs, or beliefs, beliefs associated with the area, and the person has responsibility under Aboriginal tradition for significant Aboriginal places located in or significant Aboriginal objects originating from the area or is a member of a family or clan group that is recognised as having responsibility under Aboriginal tradition for significant Aboriginal places located in or significant Aboriginal objects originating from that area. In reaching this decision, the Aboriginal Heritage Council in this Boomerang case has overridden the rights of Victorian traditional owners on the basis of unproven and spurious claims. To Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the issue then is, can we, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait, back to the heritage regimes, can we, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, sorry, in the next slide, thanks. Can we trust those advocating for us now, cultural heritage management, heritage reform? This is where I feel we need to have a, a, a um, Royal Commission is needed, folks, because we need to have truth telling. We need to have transparency in these decisions. Some would argue, and I believe, that there is collusion now between the native title process and various state government um, agencies, and I, which is impacting um, truth telling. Uh, and I would argue to all Indigenous Australians, we need to look at this. And when we come together for heritage reform, we need to be speaking for ourselves and we have to look honestly are those who are advocating that for us have they been complicit in the destruction of our sites and heritage native title is funded by the commonwealth government what and those who are spooking and speaking for us at the mouthpieces for native title are some of it we need to ask are you sponsored by the australian mineral council have you uh, currently or previously we need to declare our 
our, our, our ties. And for Indigenous peoples, we need to know that if we to trust those who are reporting. Recently, we from the Australian Indigenous Archaeologists, we resigned from the um, working group for heritage reform because we felt that the native title lawyers and their pieces were mouthpieces were speaking over and beyond their role and taking control of this. I think we do need a Royal Commission into the native title process because I don't think we are in control of our history and our heritage. And uh, when you see a collusion between the various lawyers and anthros across the state states now in heritage reform and the heritage reform agenda, and potentially with the mining companies where we don't know what those agreements are, we need to have transparency. So folks, in conclusion, nothing I feel is happening uh, uh, with regards to our indigenous heritage management and, re and re protection. And, and, and we have been in a crisis for years. Plus it is getting worse. It is the current status quo. And this status quo is a reflection, an indictment on our country and its treatment of its indigenous peoples and our heritage. Greed and racism. I don't know, but I, I have that. That is the only thing I can lead to, towards. But it's also unfortunately a reflection on our archaeological discipline, particularly our consultancy industry. We cannot have a, a, a mining body or agency or, or a, a developing body that engages and has the responsibility to engage its own um, heritage practitioners and who they choose um, to get their outcomes to make the environmental impact assessment work. Folks, I think it's time we have regulation in our Australian Indigenous Heritage Consultancy or um, um, environmental impact assessment process. We need to have set wages and we need to have governments responsible who actually choose or have a, a list that actually choose so that's not actually to the developer nor in their, in, at their advantage to choose which, which uh, consultants they choose um, to do their works and make the assessments for us. I'd argue to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we need to have that voice. We need to argue for that in our heritage reform. And we need a Commonwealth agency, finally, that oversees and manages and protects Australia's Indigenous people, respects Indigenous peoples, our values, our connection to country, and oversees the management from an international minimum standard level, but also um, takes on those who wantonly destroy our sites and heritage. No one is being blamed for Jukun. Everyone's getting away with it. This is outrageous, folks. And the Australian government with the Australian Heritage Council is sitting there and no one is responsible. We hope this will re be reflected in the Australian, um, the uh, State of Environment report that is coming out now. So finally, folks, I see that we need to regroup totally our Australian Heritage, Indigenous Heritage Management um, agenda. We do need an Australian Indigenous Heritage Commission that oversees the states to maintain minimum standards. As we finally have always said, Australia's Indigenous heritage is our Indigenous people's connection country, our cultural obligation, our spiritual connection, but is also the heritage of all Australians. And it should not just be Indigenous archaeologists or our elders who we often represent, who are fighting constantly against multi-million dollar companies and agencies sponsored by media um, murder, um, um, uh, uh, moguls who dictate and determine how we, we look after our, 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 our country, our people and its heritage. Indigenous heritage belongs to us all. It is all part of Australia's heritage. And as I have long argued, it is our, Australia's greatest unrealised asset. On that, I will say conclude folks, and I would welcome any questions. Thank you very much.